Where is, is Caitlin? Does Caitlin want to come? Oh, uh, sure. Caitlin, Caitlin Burns. Come on, Caitlin. Caitlin. Burns. Get on stage. You are another star light. Check, check. Bueno, vamos ahora sí a comenzar el panel para cerrar la jornada de este día. Quiero comenzar justamente preguntando, creo que a todo el mundo siempre, y especialmente en Latinoamérica, nos interesa, vemos grandes proyectos de transmedia en otros países, en Europa y en Estados Unidos. La pregunta es cómo bajar esos proyectos a Latinoamérica a unos presupuestos, digamos, más acordes a nuestra realidad. Ellos cómo lo ven, más o menos me gustaría que tuvieran una mirada. Guys, I'm saying that one of the biggest questions that people usually say here is that they usually see that the, those are huge projects that you are managing. So, how can you see that Latin American projects can be, I mean, taking in mind that our budgets are less, as you know. So, how can you monetize those projects, how can we do transmedia projects in South America, taking, I mean, in mind uh, uh, what I'm saying. Um, who wants to start right now? Burns. <laughs> Burns. Hola, estoy Kilen Burns de Starlight Runner. Um, one of the things that always strikes me in this, in this um, question is you don't have to start big. You don't have to start with the huge international global rollout. You can start out with small pieces on smaller platforms that fit a more modest budget and find new ways to monetize, to find sponsorship, and to find investment. In Colombia today, there's a really interesting web series called Susana y Elvira, inspired by a blog um, about fashion and makeup and women. And for its first season, it was bootstrapped. It was developed by itself. But in its second season, it started finding brand partners. And through pl product placement and sponsorship, was able to fund a much more ambitious second season. And it's an example of something that starts a little bit smaller, but is building and is continuing to build today. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, Hello? Yes? No? Yes? Can you hear me? No. no. Hello? Switch. Okay, we'll switch. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think, you know, there, there are lots of ways to start something small and then try and grow it. And you can bootstrap uh, a smaller project and create a proof of concept and then try and get uh, sources of financing to help you grow it. And one of the interesting things now is, is, is how um, creative you can be and who you go to for the funding. So there's brands. Uh, like Caitlin mentioned, um, and when you think about it, like what brands need is is attention. So if you can create uh, ways, for, uh, you know, through interesting stories, uh, for them to achieve that, um, uh, you know, you're golden. And then I think the other thing is um, that you don't. It's really important um, to realize that you can do smaller projects. Like one of the things that I always really encourage people to do if they're trying to sort of start thinking about interactive storytelling is kind of like when I was talking about the hackathons, try something really small and, and just get the sense of like what is possible and how much, thing, you know, how much time and energy and what kinds of collaborations you need and then grow from there. And then the, the final thing is just um, how important collaboration and community is. So I don't know, um, uh, this is my first time to Colombia, I don't know if you have transmedia meetups um, or anything like that if you don't start one because those are the best ways 
to kind of start to figure out who's doing what, what kind of infrastructure do you have, what kind of infrastructure do you need, uh, where is the money, where isn't the money. Um, and people are so supportive um, in this field. It's been one of the most wonderful things about doing this in, in New York City is how friendly and helpful people are. Um, during my uh, 40 minutes, I talked about breaking down an idea into installments which can be looked at like episodes. I take it a step further and say that with Facebook and YouTube, and then you add to it really simply a couple of iPhones, and you've got everything you need um, to, to build text-based stories and, uh, and video-based stories and distribute them. Talking about you know whether it's R and D or a, um, a proof of concept. So whether it's R and D or a proof of concept, it's um, the first step. I, I just there's no excuse not to do it. If you're passionate and you're involved, do it. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll learn to speak on a microphone, and then I um, I'll say that I, I think Ian's right. You know, there are certain free tools that aren't necessarily as glamorous or exciting sounding, but there's been an incredibly successful independent project in the United States recently called the Lizzie Bennett Diaries, which was a web series shot entirely on you know, consumer level handheld cameras. I mean, you could shoot it on an iPhone level camera if you needed to. And it's based entirely on classic literature, Jane Austen novels, just updated to the present. And what they did is they created Twitter and Facebook accounts for pretty much every character in the story and in between every episode they shoot, and each episode is just a character looking at the camera and talking to YouTube, basically. Um, the characters interact with each other. You know, they play out dialogue over Twitter and Facebook and all these channels. And getting people to start discovering that may be a little more difficult, but actually having the tools you need to create something, there are a lot of ways to do it that don't really cost anything. Uh, you, you good? Okay. Check, check. Hey. Um, uh, all of those are absolutely fantastic. There are some of you who are involved in marketing and advertising here in, in Bogota. Um, uh, you're involved in um, uh, corporate communication. Uh, one way that you can uh, perhaps uh, throw the spark that sets the fire is to pitch the notion of a transmedia implementation into an established campaign. You're going to do the campaign anyway. It will take a little extra work to make the campaign transmedia, and you will do the extra work. You will do the homework for the other divisions. You will go the extra mile to create engagement. Then, then um, when the response comes back, it will be a case study that you can use to prove the efficacy of uh, this technique. Um, so uh, that's in many ways what we had to do within the established uh, structure of corporations and uh, entertainment uh, media companies. Actually, can, can, oh. mm -hmm. to you. I wasn't going to say anything, but I am. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think as well what's important is cultural stories. Um, I've worked with students across Europe and over a period of time working with them I see this light bulb go on in their head when they realize that they are the best people to tell their cultural stories. And I've worked with some students that actually came across mythological characters from hundreds or thousands of years ago that they've breathed the fresh breath of life into to tell us a modern story. And I think that that's really what's important, not to tell stories that perhaps would suit for Hollywood or would suit for television. Get back to the roots of your cultural stories and figure out how culturally your audiences would behave around them. I worked on a project where there was a, a Belgian broadcaster tried to take a Swedish TV show and make it work in Belgium. Now, I don't need to explain too much except for the Swedes and the um, Flemish behave very differently around topics and around interacting with stories. So to simply try and take a template from somebody else and make it work for you guys isn't necessarily the right way. And you have your own cultural stories that possibly none of us know. And you're the people that need to tell them. I, that absolutely guaranteed none of us know. 
Um, I would also say, how many people who are left in the room at this point are students or professors or teachers? Anyone left from the academic crowd? Awesome. Cool. So if, I mean, I'll say that some of the coolest and most forward-thinking creative transmedia experiments I've seen have actually come out of college classes where what you, do, you don't write papers. You spend a semester experimenting with making different prototypes and testing what you can do with a variety of different platforms, and you come out of the end of the semester or the end of the year with amazing examples of things that you could do which get other people inspired and start the conversation. So if, if there are any teachers and you want to, I mean, I'm sure our email addresses are available through, uh, I mean, you know, we can connect you with syllabuses that have been written in curriculum material that already exists that, you know, it certainly would be free for you to use and try and build on. So just to add a comment to that, I, um, um, I got the chance after, when I started working in transmedia, I got the chance in, Ian. Uh, I got the trans, a chance in uh, Amsterdam to um, help set up a media lab where we had about 50 students every six months. And that allowed us to do a whole set of small uh, prototypes. Actually, that's when I first, uh, I knew Jeff, I was introduced to Jeff, and I had Jeff and uh, Ivan and a few other people come and talk in Amsterdam. And I think it was the first moment that Transmedia um, uh, I kind of uh, was exposed to uh, ad agencies and TV uh, ag executives and so forth, and that came through a school. And getting those kind of um, moments of uh, shared experience is really important. Since then, um, I've run a lot of two-day workshops for professionals, but now I teach as guest lecturer in the Danish Film School, in uh, Darmstadt University, in the University of West of Scotland, and in Dublin. Uh, and um, I love working on these projects with students because uh, a lot of the time um, we've got generations of students now that get digital so well, much better than a lot of the teachers that have been in the universities for 10 years or so. And I think that we're in a tipping point that more and more professionals that are coming out of the media schools are going to go into industry totally aware of what, uh, what the issues are, of how to tell good stories on the web and so forth. So. Uh, to say you're the future is too simple, but um, you get it already. And there's a lot of knowledge out there. And it's just insist that this is what's happening in the schools you're in. Thank you. Well, there is a question here from arroba cale 912. How do you build a transmedia story from tech product if it's not a narrative product such as software or a gadget? How you build a transmedia story for some tech product if it's not a narrative product, if such as software or a gadget? I mean, if it's uh, something from technology or some, a product from technology. Is, this, is it possible? I mean, it, it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is it's possible. Um, I mean, I, I know it's, it's been done. There have been some interesting-ish transmedia campaigns around a variety of things. I know Cisco networking did a pretty interesting one that they actually designed specifically as a training course for a lot of their employees to teach them how to use some of the products that they were developing. Um, essentially what they did is they, you know, they created characters and they figured out a story that would benefit from or would in some way need to work with the product. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes that can be incredibly depressing. There's an example that, that I love to use. Um, I feel like I like to ask a lot of questions about what you guys do and don't know. Uh -huh. Is the show Dexter very popular here? I mean, does anyone watch Dexter? It's a show about a serial killer? Anybody? No? Okay, yeah, now people raise their hands. Um, so, you know, a good example is Tide, the bleach, the detergent for clothing, could team up with Dexter and say, our bleach is the best for getting blood out of your clothing. <laughs> now, you can build products into stories. It doesn't mean that it's going to be good for the product. But there are a lot of ways to figure out that products intersect with stories. I want to challenge the idea that a product or a piece of software is non-narrative. There's a reason you're building it, and it's a human reason. And the way that you find investment, the way that you communicate that to anyone who's going to use it is by telling a story about how they're going to use it or why it's valuable. And understanding that and understanding the human aspect of that relationship, of why this thing exists in the first place, is the first step to 
building that bridge between your product or your software and the people who will end up using it. In a lot of cases, iterative software development includes seeking out customer stories or seeking out uh, stories from people who have the issue at hand or who are building software in a similar way. Those stories are valuable to you all in communicating the story of building the product or the software or the, the other experience that does not immediately seem maybe artistic, but is no less, is no less narrative, it's no less a story. Okay, arroba felifore pregunta, and where is the money? The numbers are too small compared to traditional media or advertising, at least in Colombia. Jeff and Allison, I'm saying, uh, where is the money? The numbers are too small compared to traditional media or advertising, at least in Colombia. Today, Vimeo, the video player, announced that it's going to start funding independent features to populate its on-demand marketplace. Amazon is funding original content. These are not just domestic U.S. propositions. They're open to international markets. The Canadian Media Fund is putting together a Netflix for interactive and regular documentary, curated, that will be international. There are a lot of opportunities on the horizon, but you have to look for them. You have to do your own homework to figure out what your story is best lent to in terms of monetization, what works, what's a good fit and what isn't. And you have to talk to other people who have different experiences seeking funding to figure out what's best for you as a business person and as an artist. Um, the idea that the numbers don't add up when compared to uh, traditional media, I was partner in um, one of the better known uh, film and television companies in Amsterdam for several years and we produced two to three features every year and uh, we received between 20 and 30 percent subsidy from um, the Dutch government and around Europe those numbers can be higher. In Denmark uh, Danish filmmakers get a lot more and the reason is that Europeans don't want to be swamped with American content but it also means that the um, content that was being made, the films that were being made were actually loss making that you broke even at 70%, or in Denmark, much higher, much lower, in other words. Um, and if you look at most independent movies, and you look at the way that the distribution, uh, you made the point quite clearly, that you know, if you, if you um, look at the way that costs and, and earnings break down, it's extraordinarily difficult to make money as an independent producer uh, in, the in the traditional way that films, independent films are, f uh, are distributed and where the money flows. So um, I think there's every reason uh, to take storytelling and take it out of the hands of um, current distribution networks uh, and, uh, and look at where the disruption is and, and where you can take slices of unnecessary cost out of where um, um, money flows in every direction except where it should flow to, which are the creatives that make the content and the producers that get the thing made. Uh, and more money needs to flow to them. And I think that what we're talking about here are opportunities to make that happen. So, right. um, We are uh, collectively working to speak with uh, uh, government officials, funders, and, and uh, 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 the... Um, uh, the, the, there, there are some uh, corporate uh, uh, executives that we're communicating with. We're going to spend this week uh, throwing the spark, but you need to demand it uh, after we're gone. You have to um, uh, look for these new forms of expression to stay competitive. If worse comes to worse, tell the people who are capable of funding multi-platform even the Italians are doing it. <laughs> okay, I mean, <laughs> they're very conservative. Um, so um, uh, we got to all work collectively to, to get the notion of funding for multi-platform uh, uh, communications going. Yeah. Uh, there's one other point as well. Oh, so, oh, sorry. I have one other example. Um, uh, two years ago, I spoke in Russia for the first time, and the same question was asked. And I got the opportunity to go back a few months ago. And a woman named Ana Maria Trenova 
had an incredible campaign of love stories and love songs that she built with a multi-platform transmedia technique. And she spent the time to go to dozens of brands until she found the one that ultimately understood and had exactly the right understanding of the tone and theme to fund the entire thing. It was by far the most successful advertising campaign in Russia in the last year, and it went to other countries as well. It's launched the careers of several musicians and has become the byword by which they are now looking to fund transmedia entertainment and advertising entertainment. The reality is it's not going to just be handed to anyone in production. It isn't handed to any of us. We have to go and work for it. We have to constantly seek out new ways to find the investment, to find the monetization, and to really engage with our audience to find it. But that's also the joy of the work, finding the right partners, finding that opportunity, and working to make your projects the best they can possibly be. If I may, I'd just like to add one little example as well. That there, I didn't have the time to show it today, but I have a collection of YouTube videos from kids, uh, from young people, from 14, 16, 17 year olds, who um, have made their own short videos. Now, even here, you have the YouTubers that they have hundreds right. and uh, thousands and it, of exactly. people There's following. a couple with 14 million plus, right? And it reminded me of uh, several years ago when the, the partners in Ardman Animation won the second of the three Oscars that they won for Wallace and Gromit, one after the other. I was lucky enough to be at the dinner in the UK when they, when they were uh, when they were discussing this and um, one of the partners got up and I remember these two guys from the they were just a few years older than me so when I was a kid I used to see these little plasticine characters that played around on the BBC uh, a kids program every week they had this one little animation so they, they were like maybe 15 16 17 when they were making them even then so he got up and he said ladies and gentlemen thank you so much uh, it's great to be an overnight success and it only took me 20 years to get here. And that's the story, right? That's the story. Nothing changes. And if you're making a little a YouTube video, that's the same as what he was doing. And it's the way to start. And it, it, no one's going to give you it on a plate. And you shouldn't have it on a plate. You have to work for it. So the only thing I'd add is I'm pretty sure there's a panel on Thursday about monetization opportunities for transmedia. So for people who want more than the 30 seconds we're able to spend on it now, there should be more then. That's true. See ya. That's, that's going to be on no, Thursday. Is Thursday, I think, at yeah. 9 a.m. Yeah, that's true. Right. Yes. Eh, si sí, está el panel de monetización el jueves, por si les interesa. Eh, lo, lo encuentran en la agenda de, de Colombia 3.0. Well, here is another question from. Oh, I forgot. Where is it? Um, Marione, arroba Marionel. He's saying that you are talking so much about how good is transmedia. And um, he's asking, where is the risk, director? I mean, yeah, where is the risk? Where, is the, where are the difficulties of uh, transmedia here? <laughs> Just because we're pointing out case studies that are interesting to make points doesn't mean there aren't badly done pieces of work out there. That with any creative endeavor, there are ones that just are not at the same level or that are a false start. And Ingrid definitely talked a lot about having to fail a couple times to figure out what your path should be. Um, the reality is it's the same risk as any other creative project or creative business. There's a, a chance that what you think is good isn't. But the opportunity with multiple platform and the opportunity to start small with small experiments helps you mitigate the risk. It helps you test it before you've spent all of your money or all of your energy on something that other people don't respond to. Being able to engage with your audience earlier helps you understand the importance of what they value and what they find interesting about your story. And that really helps you understand whether or not it's worth pursuing in an ongoing way, in a way you don't have if you, if you shut yourself away and don't have that opportunity to engage. I think, I mean, I, I think that's actually a really good question, though, because um, so in the development community, they actually started this thing in Washington, D.C. called Fail Fair because there's so many mistakes that people make in development and they wanted to talk about that and not keep 
talking about the things that were working, but actually talk about what didn't work and why. And I, I actually think that we should be doing more of that. I mean, it, it's, it's, it can be tricky. We are actually trying to do that a lot more um, with our projects, um, sometimes on a slightly smaller scale, because um, it's hard to talk about failure, but I think that's a really good question, and it's something that we should all do, and we should all do it a lot more. And the other thing, just to say, to tie it um, to what Caitlin was saying around uh, working with your audience early and, and iterating as you go, not only does it make for a better project, but I actually think that it's kind of um, emotionally really satisfying as a creator, because you're getting this constant feedback and creating a feedback loop, which actually can be incredibly fulfilling. Um, and, you know, making films, making transmedia, making any of this stuff is really, really hard. So the more that you can kind of have that um, as you're going and the more that you can be like listening to the audience and then uh, working with them, I think it's, um, I think that can be very powerful. And then just quickly going back to the monetization thing, I'm biased because I work in documentaries, but I have to say neither me nor anyone else who works in documentaries went into it for the money. It's always been problematic. Even when I was working in television, just the film business is really, really tricky, and this is not just a problem of transmedia. Making creative work is just tricky, and you've got to figure everything out. Um, and, I, and I think the more entrepreneurial you can be, uh, the, the happier you'll be, and you've, you have to wear that business strategy head along with the creative head now. There's just no excuse not to. I also, I, I may be interpreting the question a little bit differently. So uh, the, the only thing I'd add is it sounded like part of the question was all of us have been very pro-transmedia and said that it's a good thing and that you know it, it's full of these benefits and that everyone should be trying it. Um, and so I understood the question also possibly to be asking, are there downsides? Are there things about transmedia that are actually bad? Not just does it fail sometimes, but are there drawbacks or things that should make people think twice about it? The, the biggest one I would point, I mean, you could ask the same question of film or television or anything else. I mean, partly the content that you choose to put through the channels is, is the issue, but and I tried to touch on this a little bit, I think when done badly, transmedia can feel very exploitative. It can look like you're not interested in telling a better story, you're just interested in getting as much of someone's money as possible. Um, and so there's, there's certainly a downside there. Oh, uh, just one, uh, one other element. Um, once in a great while, Starlight Runner fails. <laughs> great, great while. Um, here's why. The person with the money says yes, but the creator, the visionary, doesn't want it. Doesn't want it. If you cannot create that connection, if you can't gain the trust of the person telling the story, you're not going to be able to create good transmedia. It's going to fall apart, okay? Um, so, just because you're going to be paid doesn't mean that there isn't any uh, risk because the uh, bond must be established with the, with the core creative staff. You must make sure that that exists before you accept the job. There's, there's one other risk, I think, that I would uh, maybe mention, uh, and that's on a creative level. that. Um, how many of you, how many people here are, are screenwriters? A, a few, or, or, so a few screenwriters, uh, both for TV and film, so there's five, six, seven people. You know how difficult it is to, to um, fashion, to create a script which is successful in its own way. Um, and uh, creating transmedia story structures it's just much more complex. And finding ways, and, and you know, even annotating, and finding ways where, every, where bits of story can break out while you're working on it, that is a new level of risk. It's a new level of risk in terms of writing. I mean, I'm, I'm getting to enjoy it more and more, but it's, uh, it's extremely challenging to do. So that's one level. One last thing that I think several people have touched on today is when you do this well, you invite people and you can inspire a sort of immersion and a real connection that is extremely strong with your audience. And you want to make sure that what you're presenting them is actually going to be of value to them in their lives. Because it's not quite enough to invite them and take their money. It's not um, 
just about your success or the project's success. It's about what this piece of art is conveying and what it's inspiring people to do. You don't want to immerse someone in a deep trauma and leave them there. You need to be able to think about what emotions you're evoking and what dreams you're inspiring and work very hard to create something that makes people want to do better or do more or help them heal or reconcile or expand the horizons of what they think they can do with their lives. Well, unfortunately, we don't have much time for questions. I have more here, but just one final question from a poet, Arroa Felipe Poet. Is there a space for poetry in those transmedia environments? Alison, you as a writer, you should answer this. I'd like to uh, jump into right. that because uh, who asked the question? There Put was Felipe, up. arroba Felipe Poet. I mean, uh, this is Felipe Forero. Okay. Um, I know Felipe, yeah. When I was Felipe putting, Poet. So when I was putting this together, when I put my 40 minutes together, I, I tried to think about where I would map transmedia. And one of the ways I mapped it was onto um, the games industry. And one of the ways I mapped it was onto poetry. Because um, I feel, and I've felt for a long time, that the games industry, it disappoints me continually. Because I can remember being a gamer when it was like little 8-bit games. And I can remember when the PlayStation first came out and how, I was, how excited I was by it. And, and the video game industry has become creatively stunted. And the potential of what could be made has been continually limited by the fact that the complexity of the production pathway has meant that the budgets have got bigger, the teams have got bigger, the companies doing it have got bigger, so they're all quarterly driven because they've had f uh, public money put into them. And so they're, t they're just not able to experiment. And if you take the other end of that and you talk about the nature of poetry, which is so broad and so different and so it it's as difficult to talk about what poetry is as it is to talk about what transmedia is. And so I completely uh, believe that there is a huge space in transmedia for poetic uh, uh, and deep and, uh, um, and very abstract uh, expressions. And I want to see them. And I support them in every way, every time, all the time that I can, because it's where the most interesting ways to talk about the nature of humanity and what we're trying to do is. And I live for people like W.B. Yeats is my, you know, so make transmedia poetry and make me happy. And I think that um, I showed that case study this morning of the Jay-Z book, Decode. And that was an opportunity for the fans to decode the lyrics. And I actually think a lot of rap is poetry. Um, and there are websites that you can go on to decode the rap lyrics line by line. I think poetry as an, in isolation, if it tells a story, can help to tell a transmedia story. I think it depends on the format and the pacing and the way you deliver it. If you wanted for your entire story to be told through, through a poem, there's almost a quizzical kind of message clue finding um, behavior that you could have around poetry. But I think as long as the poetry tells a story and there are fun things for your audience to do, to perhaps decode lyrics or something, then there's definitely a place for it. If it tells a story, then I think there's room, you can do fun things. I've actually seen, um, there's a couple of examples. Uh, I mean, one very recent, it's not an example of transmedia storytelling necessarily, but when Seamus Heaney died last week, um, there was this outburst of uh, quotations of his poetry on Twitter. And my Twitter feed was incredible. And when you think about Twitter, when you think about what poetry is and the the, the, the way that you have to use less to say more in many ways, and you think about the 140 characters on Twitter, there was suddenly this like, amazing use of the 140 characters and Seamus Heaney's poetry, and my Twitter feed just became this like, amazing poetic line. Um, so that's one example of, I mean, obviously it wasn't designed that way, but it happened. Um, and I'd love to see Twitter used, actually, um, for that in, 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 in other ways. Um, there's also a guy, I can't remember his name, who um, would go around Brooklyn and he would leave uh, lines from hip-hop songs in the locations where they took place. So he'd go to the Marcy Projects and he'd go. And it was really awesome to stumble across these. And I'm not sure if every, anyone ever made them into an app, but that would have been cool, too. Um, 
And the final thing is there is actually this uh, project in the States um, that came out of a film called Power Poetry, where they encourage kids to write poetry and then submit it to this website. Um, and so it's a way to encourage, uh, obviously, kids to express themselves. Um, and it's also linked to a lot of slam poetry um, gatherings uh, in New York City and I think ac across the United States. So I think poetry actually lends itself incredibly well uh, to this space. And I'd love to see, I'd love to see more experiments. Um, to bring it full circle, there's, there are projects here in Colombia that are taking incredible use of the idea of poetics and the relationship between audience and poet in hip hop uh, that are in development today, that are in development in Bogota, that have toured the world pitching. Uh, an example of Buenaventura Mon Amor, that are really a cine, is uh, a really exciting experiment that is still in development, but takes into account the ideas of audience interaction and poet interaction with one another through hip hop, dance, and art, and takes you back to some of the earlier concepts of audience engagement around poetry. In Shakespeare, you see poetic battles, where iambic pentameter is put back and forth like a modern day rap battle. You see opportunities for people to riff on one another's concepts and poetics in the history of poetry. And you can see a lot of the early classical opportunities to explore poetics and, and examples from medieval culture and, and European culture and, and the history of poetry that are very similar to the ways audience want to engage with one another. And you see hip hop are evolving organically into incredible art forms. And I believe I should plug a concert that is going on tonight with a fantastic group uh, of uh, poets from Medellin. <laughs> yes, it's going to be tonight. All right, guys, uh, Jeff, Alison, Ivan, Ian, Ingrid, Alex, Caitlin, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. You are so generous. So, por favor, un aplauso para ellos que vinieron y aceptaron esta invitación. Muchas gracias. Uh, they want to talk now. Are you going to sing? Hello, hello. It's... Hey, listen, um, uh, Allison um, lost a, a red case, a computer w in a red case. It was taken uh, uh, from, uh, from her by someone who has a badge from this uh, conference, unfortunately. Can we all just take a look around and keep an eye open uh, to see if we can get that case back, if at all possible, no harm, no foul? Just as long as she gets it back, then it's not a problem, okay? Let's help her out uh, because we are one community and it's unfortunate that that happened right here inside uh, um, uh, the center. Uh, also, um, I wanted to make sure, if we have not already, to thank the fantastic translator who has been taking our terrible English and turning it into beautiful Spanish. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you to the entire staff uh, of uh, 3.0. Yeah, I'd like to uh, just uh, say thanks for me, and I'm sure for everyone, to uh, Jaime, Jaime and his partners. Jaime. I, I, Un poco a mi grupo también, a las chicas aquí y a Cristian Vitaria Fernando Pichacón que está por aquí atrás, mis socios. You have to take this, you have to take this. I, I get a chance to speak in quite a lot of places, but the passion that I see here, he's going to carry you forward. So make sure that he comes back next year and the next year and the next year and don't let him not do it, right? So uh, this is good, this is really good, this is really unusual and uh, well done, well done, it's good stuff. Bueno, y a ustedes, de verdad, muchísimas gracias por haber estado aquí no sé cuántas horas presenciando puras conferencias sin breaks casi. Y de verdad, nuevamente, por ahí deben estar escondidos mis socios de Río Visual, Fernando Piechacón, que está por ahí en la esquina, que ha estado también tuiteando, y Cristian Vitar. Muchas gracias a todos nuevamente. Como el jueves a las 10 de la mañana.